Welcome to Dark Loops, The Seers of Artem, a program in which we, the Seers of Artem, discuss HBO's fantastic new series, Lovecraft Country. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Jordan, aka Zombie Scotty, cognitive psychologist, philosopher from Illinois State University. And tonight we discuss episode seven, I Am. Brothers and sisters, please introduce yourselves and tell the audience a little bit about who you are. And we'll start with Leandra. Hi, I'm Leandra Paris. I'm an assistant professor of school psychology at William & Mary. I focus on peer victimization, coping, trauma-informed systems in school, and social justice in school psychology. Excellent. Stanford. Hello, I'm Stanford Carpenter. I'm a culture anthropologist coming to you out of Chicago. Byron? Hi, I'm Dr. Byron Craig. I'm a professor at the uh, Illinois State University in the School of Communication. Sianna. Hey, my name is Sienna Greaves. I am a radio producer and podcast producer coming out of Chicago, Illinois. And Vanessa. I am Dr. Vanessa Hintz, licensed clinical psychologist and professor of psychology here in the Milwaukee area. Excellent. So, general impressions of this episode. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yes. Yes. I, so. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so I put in the group chat, I could hear Stanford screaming through the television. <laughs> and <laughs> the reason I could hear Stanford screaming through the television is because of what they had Atticus do this week. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I, I wonder how Stanford's reacting to Atticus's behavior in this episode. So we'll just start the conversation there. <laughs> well, I thought that the... I thought that the the worst thing about this episode is we didn't get to see Atticus's butt. I think that the um, I think that the best thing about at this episode was we didn't get to see much of Atticus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I feel like I mean, and I've been saying this every week. I feel like he's like he's basically being set up in as sort of the the black version of the of sort of the the very sort of generic white male hero protagonists of a lot of adventure movies of the 19 of, of the 1950s and 60s right mm. um it doesn't i mean I, I think sometimes i overplay my i overplay my no. my, my not liking him <laughs> but and it's not that i don't like him it's just that i find him to be you know essentially the least interesting character in the bunch right right um, like in this one, I mean, I thought that we did get a little bit of, a little bit of like reflexivity out of him when he, you know, after he yet again, um, yet again, you know, threatened his father, <laughs> you know, um, you know, because he was upset because he learned something about his father's identity. And instead of making it about his father and, and in any way trying to show any empathy towards his father and to, to like in any way deal with the fact that, you know, you know, what must it have been like to be a, a gay black man raising a son, you know, in a marriage and, and basically be completely in the closet. No empathy there. He just immediately made it about himself, you know? Um, and it was like, oh, that's why you beat me. You beat me because mm. of your issues, right? And, I, and I'm like, he See, still could have just—he still could have just been an abusive guy, whether he was gay or not. It didn't have right. to be linked. And I thought it was—it was really tough for me to to see to to see that. Yeah, so I don't mean to start our conversation on the down part of the show because we know there was so many positives to this show. So what I think we'll do <laughs> is we'll just get this negative chunk out of the way, and then we'll move yeah. on to the ninety percent of the episode that we love. But when I that scene in the hallway where he called his father that very derogatory term um i'm 
and then like you said once he got out into the the in the alleyway he created all these bizarre associations he's being written that way intentionally the the writers i don't know what their goal is um i'm just not sure what's being accomplished by that character yet and it makes me go back to the first episode where Byron said, I'm not too sure about Atticus. Well, <laughs> no. Byron knew. I'm t like, I, that whole thing happened and I actually turned the TV off and told my husband I had to, like, I have to come back to this. Like, it made me so mad. Just like mm. the whole, that whole scene in the hallway and then him me making it about himself in the courtyard. Like, not that I have a lot of love for Montrose after what he did obviously but like you've, you've said this beautiful story and he's finally come to this situation where like he's starting to accept sort of i mean he was still mad over breakfast and then he walks out and his son is immediately like right like hmm. i was just yeah i had to walk away it's it's interesting because i actually wrote that as a scene that i and when i say liked why I like the scene was because I think it was a good representation of, we talked about a lot before with Montrose and Atticus, like that intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it was a good representation of that. And I actually appreciate, appreciated the way that they depicted his sort of self-centeredness after he found out, because I think that that's like a natural, mm. typical reaction because people, he only knows his experience of it. So that's why I think he immediately made it about himself. Like, I only know how I feel in this moment. And this is something that is so like, what the F, you know, mm. that I think that it was almost like a knee jerk reaction. Right. Um, and so I think I'm less quick to judge him so harshly. Obviously I'm biased, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> but I do think that, um, and maybe I'm just cynical, but I think people are not naturally empathic. I think people mm. naturally like they just go to what they know and what he knows is his experience. And his experience was I got my ass beat and this is probably why. And so I think I'm less quick to judge him on his initial reaction. Now, if two episodes down or the next episode, he's still acting like this, like that's a different thing. But I think in the moment, like to come to that realization that someone close to you, you thought was one way and you find out they're a completely different way. And then you have your own thoughts and opinions about what that means. Yeah. I think that that was such an authentic, realistic reaction. I honestly think if he would have been like, yeah, dad, it's okay. And they would have had like a talk show Dr. Phil moment. <laughs> I feel like that wouldn't have been real. You know what I'm mm, saying? I just, no, I, I get it. I no, like I get it. it. I, there's this thing in the back of my head saying, well, if you're going to judge him, you better be lucky. He doesn't know about what you did in Korea. Right? Yeah. I mean, are okay. you really going to go around <laughs> judging people? I mean, okay. but you're right, Vanessa. People get trapped in their own story. But, th yeah. this, is, but this is where, I mean, Vanessa, I, I agree with you, but for the fact that every episode except for the last episode, somebody has said something to Atticus about his dad being gay. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like every episode, what can we rely on? We get to see Atticus's beautiful behind and someone tells him that his father's gay. <laughs> that's, that's every episode. That's, hmm. that's the reprise of this song. Well, can I say something real quick? Please, of yes, course. But, but I don't think, I think that even them saying that to him or hinting at it or kind of jokingly referencing it, I think I don't think that I can still make Tick think that, mm -hmm. you know, his father is, is, is gay, you know, mm -hmm. that maybe these people are just messing with him or he just doesn't want to receive that message. Yes. And yeah. not until he sees it visually, right? Because the, you know, the visual plays a real big role in this episode, I think, right? And when he when he actually has to confront that and see it, then you know <coughs> the explosion happens, right? And I think I think that's and I have to I, I agree you know I, I I love that they played that that way with him because I mean even if you think about it you know we hear stories all the time of when kids come out how their parents respond to them get out of my house right yeah. so to me it's not it, it's not so far fetched that. Atticus would respond that way. Um, and I have to say, in, in a way, it made me like him just a little bit. <laughs> and I'm glad, oh. he was, I'm glad he wasn't in it so much this week still. Um, right. 
but it made me, it made me, you know, I, I thought it was like an honest thing that, you know, this, 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 specifically this black man at this time would respond that way um, to, to seeing his father with, with another man. Right? Yeah, I think I keep going back to though, like the reason it made me so mad is a lot of the reasons why the last episode kept making me mad was because he was set up as this super empathetic, mm. super, like when I think of someone who like reads and like, care, like he just seems so caring. And so they mm. really set him up to be someone that you would imagine would have, yeah, a negative response, but not that, ne like, not that intent, like, something a little bit more, like, I need to step back, and then, like, I just think maybe in my head, I stuck onto that first image of him getting off the bus with his little science fiction book mm -hmm. and talking to the woman while she's walking down the street. That's still in my head is the mm -hmm. mold for him. And the last two episodes, that has been, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it just makes me mad. And I don't know. I agree I with Leandra. I think my biggest issue is the way this character is being written. Mm -hmm. um, it's, everyone has flaws. Every character in the show has flaws, has their own personal demons that they're working through. But you're seeing growth amongst almost every other character except for Atticus. It's like every week there's a new layer of, of narcissism and anger and it's shocking and it's it's just kind of a turnoff for me. And I agree with Leandra. The way the character was presented and the Atticus we have now in episode seven are, I'm, it's night and day. These are two completely different characters. And I understand being angry at your parents. I understand being, you know, hit with this news and, you know, the, the trauma of uh, physical abuse that is tied to it. But just... You know, like Mancho said, calling your father out his name like that was, mm. it just didn't, yeah. it didn't seem natural to me. It seemed really, really spiteful and hateful. The, and the, I really, the, really, really liked Montrose's response. I'm still your father. It's interesting though, because that was something that I pointed to that comes up a lot in therapy in how, where, where is the line? Like at what point can I disassociate myself from someone in my family? So is it like physical abuse? Is it sexual abuse? Is it mental abuse? And I feel like that is a lot of what we see intergener, I don't wanna say intergenerationally, but like I, I hear that, you know, particularly in the black community a lot, well, that's your mom, so you should respect her or that, you know, and I think now a lot of younger people that are coming up, it's like, well, if you don't respect me, I'm not going to respect you. And so I think that that line, when he said, I'm still your dad, it hit me because I was like, so many people stay in these sort of toxic relational patterns with family members because of that. And mm -hmm. so we know Uncle Jerry is, you know, this kind of way, make sure you don't wear that around him, but that's your uncle. So you still got to do this. You still got to do that. And I think that that, scene I was like yo that's why I I, I appreciated it because number one I think it was very realistic but I think it just was so indicative of things that like are just messy you know what I'm saying yeah. and I think that to your point too Sienna like one thing that I get a lot of things make me biased towards Tick but I think one of them too is he is a trauma survivor in all kinds of ways and I think that the bad things he does doesn't negate the trauma he experienced. And the same with Montrose, the same with everyone in the show. I feel like it's hard for me to forget that piece of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And I think that's also an occupational hazard, mm. you know? I also think it was important that his first verbal reaction in that moment was, did mom know? So, you know, you've got this narrative that Tick doesn't really know. Right. And the fact that he would experience Montrose's gayness through the eyes of his mom, that that actually kind of made sense when it was combined with the other things he said later about getting whooped all the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I, 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 what, I, what, I don't understand that. I, I don't understand that link between his father being gay and his mother and well, what I can say is if, if, if you've been whooped consistently, you generate a narrative as to why. 
you know, and um, it, you just grab onto whatever you can to try okay. to make some sense of it. Right. And uh, he and his dad have never had a conversation to provide any insight into the narrative that Tick would have created about on himself. And I, I do know that when you do live with a parent like that and you get older, there's this incredible love-hate relationship, right? There's this incredible amount of love because they're your dad. And there's this incredible amount of hate because they're a van as hell. And, you know, you were talking about, Vanessa, about it being messy. I, um, very much so. And I think sometimes in those relationships, you end up oscillating between the two extremes because the two, the two narratives aren't compatible. And so, you know, you get amped up and you're positive or you get amped up and you're negative. And, and um, they might be writing that well. I mean, you know what I'm saying? That could be, I'm just not sure. I guess me, my thing is what's in store, what I'm trying to put together, what's in store for Tick. Right. He's not working through anything. It's every episode just a new angry tick. And I think that's sort of why this sort of falls flat for me. Hmm. It just and it, He's not working new, through anything. Hmm. I'm not really seeing any growth here. He's he is a, just this ball of anger that's sort of working through this plot of magic. I mean, the two seem very, very separate at this point. And it's, it's, it's very strange. He doesn't really even seem part of the story. I mean, he was, he, he, he was definitely not part of the story. I mean, you didn't right. need him in the story at all. At all. Well, one of the these days, I was going to meet one. There. What's that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. He just felt a little thrown in there. I mean, mm. it just, you know, and then he's, you know, at his cousin's house in St. Louis and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And this is really the list. It just is, it's very, it's all very strange. False for me now, so I don't know. Well, one of these days, he's going to meet one of them women who knows how to destroy, and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know he'll um, he'll have to deal with something different. So let's but talk that, about the positive. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was, but I was also thinking that 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 that's one of the things that's kind of interesting about this. I, I this is one of those this is one another one of those stories, and 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 I've I've taught I've said this about actually about Thor and about Black Panther, right? Where like this, the, the center of those stories is, is something that everybody knew about the protagonist's dad, except for the protagonist, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and even down to, well, did mom know? I mean, it was like, it was like when he said that, it was like, oh, so you're keeping it a secret. When he said, when he said mom knew, that was the equivalent of him saying, well, damn, why are you so late to this party, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Letty didn't, Letty did not seem shocked. She mm -hmm. was afraid of what Atticus would do, but she wasn't, she didn't seem surprised, you know? And I thought, I thought that's one of the things that was kind of interesting about this. And I think that, that- He's that, really gonna lose his shit when he finds out George is his father. <laughs> 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 I, I know. I go insane. <laughs> he's so he was so upset the idea of Montrose betraying his mom. That's why I, he went there. He's like, <laughs> betray my mom, and then he's gonna find out. Like, I don't, I don't think he's Everybody the one who like, wasn't true to himself. <laughs> yeah, but I also think that this also a lot of this puts Montrose in a much more interesting light for me. So think of it this way: you're you're gay right? Um, you're married to a woman and she knows that you're gay. And the woman who you're married to mm -hmm. has a son with your brother, which you may or may not be all that concerned about. I don't know what's going on there. But, you know, I mean, yeah. Montrose is interesting. What's interesting about Montrose to me is that once you start looking at all those things, the fact that he, ste he stepped up to be a parent, mm -hmm. right? That, I, you know, and maybe, and this, maybe it's just me and my, my own like views on things, but that's a really admirable thing, right? Like, like every, all of the, all the chips are kind of pointing towards, he, he could have just walked away from the whole situation. 
Mm. Yeah, I think there's more backstory to be revealed here um, in terms of what what the the relationship between all of those adults, you know, what yeah. the relationships were. Yeah. Um, I will say that Tick is also sort of, I realized today, dragging Letty down for me as well. Mm. I'm not really yeah. interested in her pregnancy. I don't care. <laughs> like Guys. Just, they're very, very boring. But when she was back with Ruby, um, I, I love their scene together. I love the fact that they made up. Ruby well, we, and Lenny was fantastic in this yes. episode. Um, okay. Yeah, we saw that. Uh, we saw Atticus look at his mark. Mm -hmm. And he saw that mark in his, um, I think it was his aunt's picture mm -hmm. and i would not be surprised if it turns out atticus is some lovecraftian creature in other words they're, they're they're writing him this way where he you know he said we still don't know why he's so important to the great whites i mean we know he's the son of a son of a son but um he could end up really being some something we would call evil at the beginning Right. I'm not. Go ahead. I'm, I'm not, just saying he looks like they could be going that way. That would be nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, because 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 then I wouldn't feel bad for feeling so bad so about bad the character. Right. Um, yeah. But I mean, but I, I mean, I'm not convinced that Letty's pregnant. Mm. Really, really great. Because this is a theory. horror anthology. And I'm wondering, mm. you know, is she, you know, it's garlic that set her off. Yeah. I'm thinking vampire. Uh, yeah. And I saw someone today compare that to, someone said, I would be so upset if they do that with her because it will be like the destruction of the Game of Thrones, which again, I still like that last season. I can't, because I can't wait to the party with it. But, Fired what? <laughs> uh, oh, no. Yeah, they said, that, they said that by making her a vampire, <laughs> They would hate the show then, mm. um, but I mean, I would love it. But I, I, I mean, I think I kind of agree with you, Stamper. I, I think, well, with something that all of you were saying, just real quick about Atticus again, to go to to to, to um, Letty, that I wonder, are they doing this unraveling of Atticus to make us not like him, for that reason that he is going to be this this horrible kind of creature that tries to end all of them. And is that his redemption when he dies? And then is that what we're doing? That they have to, that maybe they have to get rid of him somehow, right? And then that, you know, because I, I, I'm, I, I'm with you, Stanford. I'm not so sure Letty's pregnant. Mm -hmm. I don't, <coughs> um, or, or more importantly, a regular pregnancy. I would say if she, if she is pregnant, I think that now we're looking at now we're looking at some like 1970s demon seed child running around. That that's exactly um, I'm here for that. That's exactly an option. And from a look from a writer's viewer perspective, that would be bold. The guy walks up with the bus off of the bus in episode one, reading a sci-fi novel. We fall in love with him, and then all of a sudden he becomes what we would traditionally call evil. It'd be interesting as if he does become that, that we're thinking about evil differently because of everything else we've been through for all these episodes. It, it would be bold as hell. Um, let's talk about what we really, really liked about this episode. Ruby was serving us looks this week. <laughs> she, she was what? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was a goddess this week. Them legs. I, I, need, a pair yes, of those girl. Yes. I need a pair of those red shorts. Yes. That window scene, was she sitting oh. in the window scale? Was exactly. Yes, but the sunglasses, yeah, that was just, hmm. <laughs> yeah. and This is going to sound crazy, and I know I'm about to get yelled at. Uh -oh. I'm about to drop a bombshell right now. Am I shipping Ruby and Christina? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit? Okay. Uh, no, <laughs> no, that sexual tension when she was like, it may have been his lips, but I was the one saying I they was yeah. they were actually and like I have not been a fan of Christina, like like whatever, like I but like that scene, I I was a little like I don't know. I mean <laughs> 
So I thought that was a good moment acting writing wise because I think it, I think it, have, have I, or excuse me, I think Ruby experienced that moment sincerely mm -hmm. and it, it mattered to her, but it only, you know, kind of came and went and, you know, we'll see if it comes back. But, um, so if you're going to ship the two of them, does that mean that your your respect for Christine as a character is, is growing or uh, just that relationship? I think just and if you have any respect. Yeah, for I just want Ruby to be happy. And she looks sincere in her, like, this could yeah, work for I me. Yeah, it's just like a physical <laughs> relationship. If they're just lovers, I'm good with them. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I... It just I, makes me sad, though. <laughs> I mean... I felt it. The chemistry between those it was. I felt the chemistry, but but damn, Ruby be sleeping with evil. I mean, <laughs> that'd be like. I mean, and, and that, I mean, because because actually that was that was actually one of my one of my favorite scenes, because it's this moment where like I I, I see everything that you that, that you're talking about, Sienna, but at the same time I was just like, what was said laid out, shall I say, the depravity of Christina mm. in a way that was more blunt than ever before. You know, and, and I and I and, and I actually wrote it down. I was like, you know, you know, um where, you know, first Ruby says, you know, you've been lying to me this entire time, right? And then Christina starts talking about like, you know, the fact that that, you know, that the potion is based on the blood of these two dead people, blah, 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 right? And and there's this moment where, the moment where Christina says, I could be so much more, do things most people couldn't imagine. And then Ruby's like, Ruby says, like, fuck me as a man, right? And then she responds, I never lied to you. The words may have come out of William's mouth, but they were mine, right? And it's a really powerful moment. At the same time, I'm like, but wait a second, two episodes ago when you were talking about how this potion unlocks your desires, right? Mm -hmm. It really wasn't unlocking your desire because Christina can only, can, Christina's potion turns you into the person whose blood it's based on. That wasn't a, that, so like Ruby's yeah, whole journey, it's, 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 it's not it's about her desires. It's, about what, it's, what, it's, it's what? an aesthetic, but. Christina made it very clear that she was the one who was speaking those words. And I mean, so she looked like William, but. So from a writing perspective, is there something that's going to be achieved through these two characters in their relationship? I. I'm, I mean, I, they're, they're writing, I all of this so. is intentional. I think right? so. Yeah. yeah. I think Are, so. Are we on a redemption arc for Christine through her no, relationship? No, 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 I, no. Because there's still the lie, which was interesting that Lady didn't bring up the fact that that money that she said was her mother's, mm. but she knew that it, it wasn't her mother. I mean, she could have sort of fessed up a little bit between that scene of her, between her and that scene between her and Ruby and sort of, mm. you know, smooth some of those waters there. But she, she, I mean, a lot is going to come out about Christina and her involvement with Tick and Letty and apparently her own family. Um, yeah. That's, you know, but I, I, I like the idea of, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like it too. Although I will say you brought up the scene with them like in the kitchen and stuff. Mm -hmm. It hit me that they have both had some really big supernatural experiences that almost got them killed right. and they're keeping it from each other. Mm -hmm. like. How do you have the conversation where like they're both actually involved in the same thing and have no idea? Right. But come taste my spaghetti sauce. Mm -hmm. Like I don't. It's just a big. It was just a big moment to like sit there and watch that and be like, oh, you guys don't actually know. And Ruby yeah. herself is very intentional. She's very calculating. She thinks things through. Yeah. She doesn't just sort of run off of emotion the way that Letty does. But Christina also mentions that the Book of Names involves Ruby and her family. But if the Book of Names is about Tick's family, then that means, so now now it's like, okay, so what are, what are the relationships between all of these people, right? Mm -hmm. 
And and are we going to be really grossed out <laughs> by the fact that Tick and Letty are together once we find out? I think that I, could, I, I think that connection might be something different. Um, I picked up on. I've been trying to pay attention to how many times they mentioned Tulsa in this right. show. And, and I'm just wondering if that connection just becomes a moment where there was this other traumatic event um, that, you know, we know that, you know, there's this ancestry, ancestry thing going on here, but I keep wondering, is the connection where it's, it's, it's the connection where there's been this, this great um, travesty that's been done to all, of the, to all of these people where, you know, because first I thought, damn, are they, are they gonna be like, you know, brother and sister or something, or, you know, cousins, or, it was like, God, come on. But then I thought, when I heard them mention Tulsa again, I'm like, okay, maybe there's some kind of connection they're making with some event that's happened. Um, they're both of their families being part of the great migration from Tulsa to Chicago, maybe something like that. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, I, I think it's, I mean, I think we're, I, we're, that we're definitely building up to, you know, Tulsa being the, the cover, you know, our, the Tulsa massacre being the cover story for some sort of Lovecraftian event. I mean, right. I, we're definitely going in that direction. The question for me is going to be like, okay, what's the nature of the event and what is the connection between these people because they, they all seem because they keep talking about only like one or two only like one family survived right and we know that the book of names is related to all this as well now right right um so it's interesting because um um how watchmen started with tulsa and it wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised to see this one end with tulsa right as a sort of backstory reveal in the last episode that kind of pulls all these threads together um at least that's kind of what i'm hoping happens um i i, I like you I, I noticed the moment of tension between christine and ruby and i i'd like to see those things play out you know when 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 they when they get me interested i like to see it sort of play out it was hot it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I may, if, if I may, if I may, about <laughs> if I may. Yeah. I I'm of two minds about this. One, it was hot, and as a as a lifelong fan of the Young and the Restless, I love a good like let's throw something in there that's just like oh shit okay, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like let's just make it so dramatic, like everything going on with Tig and all these layers and you have like sexuality and paternity like yeah this is just the young and the restless one thing i didn't like about it is i feel like christina has tried every angle to try mm. like get in so let's play the you know like we're both women hey girl what's up and i feel like part of me thinks that now it's sex like hey girl like i find you attractive like yeah what's up you know what i'm saying and so <laughs> It's hard for me to think that she genuine, like her uh, seduction is genuine. And that's why I think it's like, girl, go. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like it, it, that's the part of it that I'm just like, because Ruby is everything. Ruby yeah, is but I don't think Ruby was in love with William, nor did I think she thought William was in love with her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I just, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't like Christina. Right. And I, feel, I just feel like she's and using She's just using well, I, all she's done is okie dokes the whole season, right? So it's really hard to believe that there isn't another one. And okay, yeah. So um, what I what I will say is I do think I think what the way they've written Ruby is she kind of knows what she's getting into, so she doesn't really seem to have a hard time playing with danger. Mm -hmm. um, she's more than comfortable being around the fire, and she trusts herself to be able to get out of it. And uh, I, mean, I, I like the presence of a character like that. And yeah, I do think they're centering the show quite a bit on her stability. I do. I agree with that. And I think, and I'm trying to figure out like why I'm so into her and Christina. And I think it's because I know that Ruby's not the one that's going to get hurt. No, oh, like, fair enough. In this situation, right. like if there's someone who can bring Christina to heal, it's going to be Ruby. Like Letty, true. But like Ruby's in, like, I just... I want this to happen. I want Christina to actually fall. I, I want that whole mm -hmm. thing to happen. 
and I want Ruby to be the one who holds her accountable. Like, I just, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. All righty. Favorite character? Hippolyta! <laughs> I said it, I said it weeks ago. I said there's something about her. She's a genius. She's so smart. She's underplayed. There's something coming. And then they gave me this episode and I feel redeemed in my, so. You know, fantastic. Are you all Hippolyta favorite character? Absolutely. She is, for me, this episode, yes. No, but that's it, yes. I think, what I think was wonderful is the entire story arc essentially was all about proving that Hippolyta was too good for this show. Mm. <laughs> Mm. Because what happens? She goes to this journey, and in the end, she goes off to another plane of existence to be bigger, better, and grander than any of the things that are happening here. Hmm. I, for for me, I, I just <laughs> love the poetry and the meandering fantasy of that whole sequence. Uh, they didn't... She's here... Then it's kind of a, 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 a dark looking place. And then later she and George are in this Peter Maxey kind of looking fantasy place. And I just loved how much time they just spent just being in this place that didn't have to make a whole bunch of narrative sense. It was just her being a discoverer. And I, I just like the way it just went on and it went on. And um, that was delightful because you kept expecting it to end. Right, and and it didn't, and um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that part of it. Yeah. Yeah, as heavy and and dark as the tone of the show has been, it was nice to see a character step into the light, and you know they really took the the audience with them. I mm. was excited every time she was excited. I felt like I was experiencing all these these experiences with Hippolyta. I mm. mean, very well written, brilliantly acted. Um, it, it it was it was a great reprieve from some of the the darkness of, of Lovecraft Country, especially that it happened <laughs> right after she shot a cop, and that was sort of the big drama. But then it was like we don't even have to deal with that right now, and it it was great. It was a total escape, and I I, I really really loved it. So and I, I, I go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go. No, no, go for this. I, I think what I love too, and, and the monologues were giving me like scandal vibes because I feel like it was like the, the, when she was there with Josephine Baker, that mm. whole conversation they had at the bar, this, to me, this episode was like a, a love letter to black women mm. it, because she was, she with Josephine Baker, she was like sexy and then she went to like that sort of warrior scene where she was strong and then she was like I'm a wife and you know like she it was like all the things I don't have to be one of these things I can be all of these things yeah. and I think that like her the the monologue and the, the warrior scene, like all of this I was like ooh, this is bringing me back um Scandal mm. had the best monologues of ever mm. um, so I think it just to me that's why it was so beautiful because I think that um what what I took from from a lot of her messaging was she felt sort of like pigeonholed like I have to be this one way whereas all of those different scenes was like okay no I'm like it's like a gestalt like I'm all I'm more than the sum of these parts and it was just to me that's what black women have to be um mm. in, in the world but the world doesn't want us to be that they want to mm -hmm. pigeonhole us as angry as <clears throat> aggressive as a welfare queen as whatever but it's like mm. nah I'm all of these things and more. And that's what I think was so beautiful about what she did and how it was, you know, acted and written and everything. And they just took their time with it, mm -hmm. right? They just, they, they, they didn't force a plot structure on it. Um, and so it got to be her ongoing experience in a very free way that was, that for me, accentuated the dialogue in terms of who she is. So what I'm going to say is, is meant to, catalyze what you guys are saying because i'm going to say that my favorite character was the josephine baker character um she's the one who was a catalyst in the sense for hippolyta's space she didn't cause hippolyta's space hippolyta wanted to be there but the conversation they had at the bar which is my favorite line 
is just off the hook. And I'm going to read the whole thing because Josephine Baker says, nights like this, I burn so bright, I feel like a star. And Hippolyta says, you are a star. And she says, no, no, Sherry, not like a movie star. Anyone can be that. Me, I feel like the stars in the black of space, magnificent, ancient, and already extinguished. Damn. That's just a lot to say and, and matter. And what it does for me is, is she was expressing in that moment how alive and lonely she was to some extent, you know, that extinguished line. And then she says, uh, to Hipp uh, she says, most of the girls never notice when I get like this. And she says, you knew just where to look. So the two become a, you know, a, a con the two become a mirror image of each other, I think. Um, and, and Hippolyta's struggle provides a place for this Josephine Baker character to express to someone, I'm completely alive and there are times when I don't feel, at least that's what I took out of it. Right now I thought, wow, these are now partners in crime. These are peers, these are women who are living to the fullest and there are still times when it doesn't feel great. At least that's, I just thought that was, and besides the woman that played Josephine Baker, her name, Kara Patterson can dance. And I am a sucker for a dancer. <laughs> oh my God, the joy she brought to the screen. Oh Lord, I miss. So, and that whole vibe penetrated everything she did. I, I just love that it was so alive. And dare I say, well, I'll just leave it at that. It was alive. Mm -hmm. She needed um, to dance, so she's playing Josephine Baker. Uh, can you say that again, Byron? I couldn't hear you. She needed to be able to dance if she was playing Josephine Baker. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, but but I put in the in the chat box, um, and, and as I as I read this, uh, as I watched this article, watch this. I'm getting the article and the show mixed up. Uh, th this show took me so much to um, one. One of our colleagues has an essay in the Quarterly Journal of Speech called "Slipping in and Out of Frame: An Afrofuturist Feminist Orientation to Black Women in American Citizenship," and you know, you're talking about Josephine Baker here, and, and this article would place Josephine Baker in Hippolyta um, into this kind of, talking about this, this rhetoric of refusal as acts of fugitivity, right? Mm. And, and these acts of fugitivity, because they have to slip in and out, right? They have to deal with this, with this world of anti-Blackness through their own Black women's truth-telling. Right, and that's what we hear from Joseph, when Josephine Baker is talking to her, when Frida comes down those stairs. Right, this is uh, when, in, in, in when she when Hippolyta is traveling, when um, what's her name, Serafina, is talking to her. Mm -hmm. These these are all dialogues of of you know these refuse of of, re, of refusing, right, to 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 the and, and and becoming and taking on this notion of the fugitive. Josephine Baker left the United States. Right. These mm -hmm. are, you know, what what Afro Afro futurist re, um, feminists would call these these acts of fugitivity. In this article, puts um, um, uh, Cardi B and As uh, um, um, Asada Shakur in conversation with one another. Right. So, what having to slip in and out of these spaces where they're not welcome where they're violated, where, they're, where they have violence done on their bodies. Um, and this is what this, this episode just was so much about to me. This, this whole idea of you know, having to slip out of these and be dynamic and make yourself invisible and visible right. to just kind of a, a, a escape these structures of, of white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? That, that black women have to deal with. And that's another thing, reason why I, res why I admired this episode so much, because it, it dealt and gave us this narrative of a Black woman during this time, right? But also making us realize it's probably not just wasn't Black women during that time, right? The 20s with Josephine Baker having to leave, which I thought was, you know, that they did. I'm so glad they brought her into this. Um, but then Hippolyta, Hippolyta in her time having to leave, right? And, and then having to make that very difficult decision of, do I come back, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that line that she used that when, when she was talking about that, um, what did she say? Um, uh, what did I do with it? I, um, she said, um, if I don't, what did she say? If I don't um, change, 
what does she say? How I think can she I says fit, if I how don't. Can, how can I fit into everything that I am now into that place, right? And I'm, I was, I'm, I'm uh, I guess, thinking that place is back um, with her family, right? But she, she's able to have that moment of slipping in and out of frame, right? Through, the, through this multiverse experience that she has. Um, and I think it helps us really to think about this, um, you know, also kind of this defiance of this mythical authority of anti-Blackness, right? Through these rhetorical acts that she's performing and that, that rhetorical act is slipping in and out of that frame um, in order to, you know, escape that white supremacy. Um, and, and, and actually to kind of deal with that kind of current place that she's in that's so violent, right? In order to regain and to have and to keep her own agency, her own black women's agency. Um, so I think, I think that was really powerfully done um, in dealing kind of with this spatio kind of temporality, you know, mm -hmm. as, she's, as she's slipping in and out of that frame. I thought was just, was, was beautifully done this week. Um, but, but it just, it, you know, I, I have to give a shout out to, to Ashley Hall for that because, I mean, her writing about this, and this is like while she's building her, her career on this notion of this Afrofuturist um, um, feminist rhetoric is, I think, spot on in this episode of Lovecraft. Fantastic. Um, I think my favorite line, um, well, the line that I picked was um, from that same um, scene of, of Hippolyta and Josephine, Hippolyta being in Paris and, and being with Josephine Baker when she says, now that I've tasted it, freedom, like I've never known before, I see what I was robbed of back then. Um, mm -hmm. That really stuck out for me. Um, I think as someone who grew up as a very dark-skinned Black girl in predominantly white spaces, I myself went through many, many years where I felt that I did need to make myself small mm. um, to either be invisible to the glare of anti-whiteness that I felt all through, anti-blackness that I had to deal with through elementary school and middle school and high school. Mm. Um, and to also, you know, be invisible or, or small just to slip into spaces um, that, um, were considered to be anti-Black, and that's, you know, being an adolescent who was into comic books, an adolescent who was into sci-fi fantasy, you know, a teenager who liked alternative music and, you know, wanted to skateboard and, you know, growing up in the suburbs of New York, those were not spaces that were very welcoming to Black kids, especially Black girls, um, especially Black girls uh, of a certain hue, we sh will say. So um, that is something that personally I, I really had to deal with. Um, that was something that that feeling small and being made to feel small, you know, is unfortunately not something that, you know, Hippolyta had to deal with in the 50s. And it's something that very much is, is a very much a reality for Black women and black men today, you know, in the halls of academia, in media, in, you know, politics, in, um, you know, just about any workplace I can imagine. Um, but there is something where you, that feeling when you come into your own and you find your own black voice and you sort of realize that, wow, I, I am capable of doing these things. I am capable of greatness. I am capable of excellence. And I've had those moments that, you know, I, I've thought back, like if only I had this confidence in myself, mm. if only I realized that maybe, and this is very, very emotional, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you know, it's, um, how would my life have been different? Maybe I would have tried a little harder to reach mm. for things that I thought um, were unattainable. Yeah. Um, things that I thought that I didn't deserve or could never have. And, um, you know, 
I think this was, this episode um, really spoke to that, that weathering um, that Black people deal with every day in the country. It's not just acts of violence. It's not just, you know, the sort of outward um, hatred and the segregation. It's not just because the whites only signs are down. It doesn't mean that we aren't still dealing with these micro aggressions every single day, every time we walk out of our house, every time we leave a black space. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at this new generation of, of Gen Zers, and as annoying as they are, their confidence, I mean, really makes my heart glow. Um, I go on TikTok and I like, I want to be like them, right? <laughs> They're so cool. They're just so confident and mm. so self-assured. And they don't worry about, you know, it, it's just about being themselves 100% all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you see dark-skinned girls wearing lipstick colors that I never would have imagined ever wearing. Because you know what I mean? That's just, we don't wear those colors. We don't, you know what I mean? It's... Mm -hmm. It's just very, very interesting. I don't know, but I, I, that, that one line really, really resonated with me. And I, 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 I found it, there was a, a, a brutal honesty to this episode mm -hmm. and um, a reality of being a black woman in, a, woman in America that I have never, ever, ever heard articulated mm. before. Well said. Mm. Mm. And I, and I think to your point and to, to the point Byron made too, like you saw Hippolyta in the 20s with Josephine Baker and her experience in the 50s. And I think she made reference to, you know, I got to go back for D, she needs me. So then you right. see D in the 70s. And like to your point, Sienna, that same narrative is happening now. I mean, mm -hmm. there was an overt act of violence against Breonna Taylor. What justice has, what is her life worth? I, apparently nothing. Um, and so I think that the, the thing that, again, we talked about this at the very beginning of Lovecraft Country, how it's so scary because it's so real to Black people. And I think to Sienna's point, this episode really drove home something that is unique to Black women um, and sort of like that experience and that narrative that I think so often gets lost because even think about everything we've been dealing with over this past summer and how, you know, Breonna Taylor's name kind of got lost and, and, you know, she, she's getting no justice, you know what I'm saying? And so there's this, there's a lot of conversations happening around the erasure of black women. And so it's almost like the defense mechanism against that, whether it's on, it's consciously or otherwise is to let me just fade into the background, kind of like to Sienna's point, let me do what I can to not, leave space for any of this aggression because it's very clear that my life, my being, my experiences are not valued. I'd like to stay on this you made me small discussion mm -hmm. um, because I thought her, I thought Hippolyta having that conversation with George was just stunning mm -hmm. because, you know, we've seen him as probably the most understanding, empathetic character in the entire story and then suddenly he's being called out by his wife and she's holding him responsible, partially responsible for her shrinking. And he has an initial reaction. Oh, you should have told me, you know, the automatic defense response. And, and then he listens. And then this, this behavior is modeled. That's just fantastic. And that is just listen, take it in. And, and let it go where it goes. And um, even if that's space. What's that? <laughs> even if that's to space. Yeah. On oh, a wild yeah. adventure. No, let exactly. it go. And I, I think that, that what, I, what I also really like about that is, I mean, they became discoverers together once, once he was willing to admit to how his life had constrained hers. And um, then they could be in a space of mutuality that they couldn't really be in before. And then going on these space adventures as Team Explorer is just delightfully, and it's, it delightful, it's, it's poetic for this idea of what you can do 
with another person when you truly understand each other. And, you know, Hippolyte eventually comes back because of dependence, right? The daughter's dependent on her. And though she doesn't say it, I would argue she's also dependent on the daughter. It's just not that the daughter needs her. I think there's a mutually dependent relationship there. And I, I love it when, um, when we get to see this exploration of mutual dependence play out and have people recognize, you know, my kids have heard my wife and I have arguments. And, you know, they look, oh, I said, wait a minute. Dad can party all night with the next door lady. And she can go home the next day and do whatever she wants. And it has no impact on me. So it may look like I like her more. But in fact, I'm dependent on your mom. And your mom's dependent on me. And that dependence is something we don't value enough, in, in at least in the culture I live in. Uh, we don't talk about the things that come from mutual dependence. If there, are, if there are things I don't do, it screws up my wife's day, my wife's week. If there are things I don't do, it screws up her life, her day. And that dependence is, is one, of the part, one, of the, one of the parts of love that I don't think we pay enough respect to in this country because we expect love to be this per, perpetually positive smile on your face thing. And, and I'm sorry, but for me, it's this, this uh, I'll just say, uh, soul-consuming dependency that develops over time. And my wife is I, and I am my wife. And um, everything I do matters to her and vice versa. And I just kind of liked where they were able to go in their relationship very poetically and visually when they kind of understood that about each other. Because I, I don't see that talked about at all. And I think that's a detriment to love particularly old love, which, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'll shut up. Well, that makes sense, though, because I, it, I feel like in, this came up earlier when we were talking about Montrose and Atticus. I mean, you sort of feel like the, yeah, Montrose's mother knew. And mm -hmm. Atticus, and, and Montrose is also very much aware mm. that Atticus was not his son. I mean, you just sort of had a yeah. It sort of feels like the adults were in the background doing what needed to be done and that they had a very, very healthy, <laughs> yeah. a very healthy, open and honest dynamic between the four of them. I really hope that's how it plays out, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I really hope that that's the backstory they tell because it's we, not a backstory we see. I, I, we don't see it in contemporary, I don't know if ever in an American narrative, right? Um, not a love that strong. People need to know that. Atticus is George's son. She okay. So I went back and watched the episode where someone's talking to her, and she talks about how Addis leaves the cup the same way, and like it's hard for him to be a, like he reminds her so much of George. Mm -hmm. I think if she doesn't explicitly know it, like she does suspect it, and I do think it speaks to something that happened at that point, and it speaks to the relationship that all four of them had, right? Like a sort of respect and love that is mm -hmm. different than what people think of when they hear situations like that, right? Mm -hmm. So but I think it, yeah. But it's also reflected in the um in the, the the kind of implicit blendedness of those families, right? The first time that Atticus when when Atticus comes home, like like Dee's Dee's like expression of mm -hmm. joy and love for seeing Atticus is not a cousin type of love that's a brother sister kind of love right mm -hmm. so it's and and they all live and live like in the same relative the same place i mean it's clear and then then that the scene later where montrose is shopping with hippolyta i mean it's clear that there's that there's some real like like blending in there and i mean maybe i'm just seeing maybe i'm just seeing my own history in it in that like in that, like in my family, we have we actually have interfamily uh, some interfamily adoption within my family. So my sister is my sister is is my cousin, but we were mm -hmm. raised as twins because we were really close in age and we we're both raised by my mom and dad. Um, but it also, what w the fact that we know about that actually alters my relationship with one of my, with my cousin, who's also my sister's brother. You know that like there's that like. 
that like there's this weird kind of transitive relation transitive property right where like mm. i see that cousin as being more of a brother to me than my other cousins and it's and it all comes out of that knowledge of the of of the shared overlapping kinships right um and and so and i i kind of and, and maybe it's something i want to see but it is something that i'm seeing in these relationships not to, not just with the kids but with the adults and i also because when i when i see what's happening in these adult relationships i actually see that in the adult relationships above me centering around the around this blendedness right and um and so i think that that's i think that's one of the things that's really interesting about it the other thing i think is interesting about this episode is that ultimately hippolyta and and i was kind of joking about it earlier but ultimately hippolyta really does she she figures out everything that's happened and it's ultimately her, for lack of a better word, destiny to leave, right? Because she does leave. She leaves, D, in the end, she leaves, D, she leaves D behind. She leaves, she's leaving everything behind. And, and at first I didn't believe it, but then I, then I was listening to an interview with the writer and the writer's like, yeah, she left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like that, like that, that like, but I think what's, what's interesting is like, it's like when we read the Odyssey, we don't talk about Odysseus as an absentee father because he was gone for <laughs> ten years, of, you yeah. know, decades of the yeah, lives right. of his kids, right? Right. You know, because that's what the man's supposed to do. He's supposed to go out, well, discover, so. explore, and when he comes back, he comes back. But if he doesn't come back, it's because of some greater destiny, right? Um, right. And we don't. And 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 who's left behind to take care of the kids? Right. Um, what I think is interesting is it's kind of implied, well, and I'd like to think that it's implied that George is, that, that somehow this has reshaped things so that George is gonna be there to take care of the kids, right? And mm. I think, but I think what's interesting is that moment, is that she does get that moment to leave. And it actually, you know, one of the last things that's said is actually, is actually my, all, my, my favorite quote from, from, from this episode. It's, um, it's when it's at the very end when it's about when it's about um, when it's about leaving, um, and um, Serafina says, "Now that you've named yourself, we can fully integrate you into our society." Right, and I thought and I thought that was so powerful because ultimately it's like Hippolyta goes on this journey. It's it's about death. It's about pain. It's about loss. It's about letting go of the things most precious it's about joy it's about sorrow but ultimately none of that matters the suffering doesn't matter in so far as like suffering per se what matters is that she comes out of it and she's able to define herself you know and i think that there's something in there about about what it is to be about about the future of being African American, right? That it's not about being defined by the events. It's about being at peace with the events and at peace with oneself enough so that you can say, this is who I am. And that's when you, that's when you really start to take your place, but you can't take your place if you're defined by others. I, 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 I very much like what you just said. I, I, yeah. I think I told you guys when I was in fifth grade, I complained to my teacher once about another student and the teacher said, well, Mr. Jordan, why don't you go take a walk around the block and see if, see if it still stinks. Uh, and what, what, what I, getting, traveling, going to different places, putting yourself in context that you've not known does reveal some things about you that are you versus the road, right? And I, I do think it's healthy to sort of suss out how many of your problems are you and how many are the road. And you only know that when you go to a different place and, um, and come back with, I, I would call it come back when coming back with a sense of self-respect because um, she chooses to come back and, and, and um, be Dee's mom. And, um, and when she gets there, she's not the same person who left. 
and she's there in a way where she has seen everything she is and can be and she's in this space knowing all of that um, um yeah i'll stop there i do i like that she just simply says but d needs me like and that's it and i will say as someone who struggled the last couple months year or so i don't know if i would have went back like <laughs> you know like i really i was like nah like if she doesn't go back i get it like there are days i don't want to go back mm. like so for i think it was something really beautiful about it. she's dressed like the superhero that d drew she's become the woman that d really imagined as the strong black woman and she's saying and i need to go back for her I don't know. I thought was a. I would have understood if she chose not to. It would have been very interesting if she had chosen not to. Um, chose not to what? To go back. Go back. But she didn't go back. Oh yeah, that's also a good point. Like she says, she's gonna like you assume she's going back for D, but then you don't see her. Well, she's on back. her way back when Atticus turns the machine off. Oh right. Okay. Remember and takes the key. He's. <laughs> but maybe oh, but yeah. mess it up and once again once again no, no the thing is that she said right but if you look at the dialogue right she says d needs me and then she's like but, but and basically basically that's what 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 moves it to the next part of the dialogue and ultimately she says you can come with us or not right so it's it's mm. That, that was why that was why I read the interviews with the author to find out, well, is she really gone? And the author's like, she's gone. Oh <laughs> I like, well, I don't blame her. You well, know. author of the, the, the script writer or the author of the book? Script writer. Oh, the script writer. Yeah, of the oh. episode. Because I definitely read that as like, I should go back. Oh, spoiler. <laughs> I have to say this part of the TV show series was so much better than this part of the book. Uh, this part of the book was interesting, but not nearly as rich and capable of making the points that uh, Byron mentioned earlier. Right? Um, this one was really well, really well done. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting for her for her not to, because I, I would assume that she would have been back in the observatory if she had gone mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Right time, but um, well, I won't say anything because I'm just thinking about. Well, Atticus I mean, has I just, the key, so I mean, can they not? So she's not coming back. Okay, all right. Well, well, well that makes me know. like sad that we maybe we won't see her again because I I love where this went. Maybe she has a different way to come back now that she's in touch with these higher. higher I think teams. they've unleashed a a ton of poetic possibilities, and as you know, as you said last week, Byron, this being more story about the supernatural. Uh, now Hippolyte is in it. She's got the key to it. And um, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see the show increasingly make its points through these poetic mediums instead of in Chicago. Um, and um, because that unlocks fantasy, that makes more and more things possible. Um, at least I kind of hope that's where they go. Because I just loved, particularly the, the scene with her, it, it it was just delightful. It was, I'm going to say playful in a sense, that it was mm -hmm. just her trying out different versions of herself. And um, I just reveled in watching someone play like that, even though a lot of the scenes weren't playful per se. But, you know, this is all, this is all, this is what the parents I know try to do for their kids. They try to create a space where they can play with who they are. And, um, you know, unfortunately, kids are cruel to each other and don't let each other play. And for a lot of kids, the world's very cruel and doesn't let them play. But um, being able to do that completely matters. I, I like this so much that I think it, for me, it, 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 um, it just kind of makes me think that, you know, for <coughs> the goal maybe doesn't become, and I'm just thinking, you know, more meta here that it doesn't become this notion of trying to defeat anti-blackness, racism. I'm just just something that I was thinking about when I was watching the episode. It is it's not about trying to defeat anti-black racism. It's about um, conceptualizing your place in the world differently, 
right? And I think that's what she was, you know, what, what Hippolyta is, is really able to do now is to conceptualize her place in the world so much differently or in the worlds, because I think, I think there's still gonna be something mm -hmm. bigger with her um, for, as, as the series ends or this, you know, season or whatever it is, I'm not sure is a season or series, but however it ends, she's going to play such a big role because I think it's just, you know, this, her ability to, <coughs> to finally, you know, have that reconceptualization of herself um, in this world through her ability to tell and to live out her own truths. Right, and to make her truths speak about something larger, right? So, you know, here's the thing. I love the show so much right now because it's, it's putting all these ellipses in there, right? Mm -hmm. And it, we're all struggling to have to read what, what the heck is going on? Who, what, what is really the thing about this character? And I absolutely love that. I love those, those spaces where I have to get in there and try to think you know, about what, <coughs> excuse me, about what's going on. So much so that I actually ordered, I ordered this book. I ordered the uh, Lovecraft Country book, but I also ordered, um, um, what was his name? What's his name? Lovejoy stuff. Oh, Lovecraft. Um, all his stories. Yeah, I ordered all his, all his stories because I want to read them to see how, to see how they're written. Um, mm. But I also want to read this book and see how it's written. But mm. I, I will say this about the series for me. I just love this, this whole uh, for me, I'm having to be creative. It's making me think creatively about what, what the heck really is going on here, what might happen, or, you know, what, did, you know, what's going on with Hippolyta now, right? Is she, you know, is she going to come back? And if she doesn't, what happens if she does come back? And I'll be honest, I usually don't watch the previews for the following week, but I watched a little, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of the previews for next week, just like a couple seconds of it. <laughs> With the episodes, like, I don't want to stop watching it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just, I'm just imagining what Hippolyta is going to have to do um, to take, to, to kind of um, save some of the lives. Because I'm just seeing her now as someone who's going to have to save some lives yeah. um, in, as, as, as the series goes on. Because um, I don't think that she is going to take all those acts of, again, fugitivity and not do something with that. No, well said. I think there's something that she's going to do with it. Um, and the spaces that are opening up, she doesn't have to do that as Hippolyta in Chicago. Right. Right. There are many different ways that she can do that saving yeah. that may not even come to the idea of saving a human on Earth's life, but yeah. just have the idea of saving everybody else from getting small. Yeah. Right, saving people from shrinking, and yeah. um, I, I, I just wouldn't. They, they've created enough space for themselves. They can go as poetic as they want now, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I totally dig it. Question: but then It's ahead, still Chicago, ahead. though, in that like, like, all of this is really Sun Ra, right? <laughs> yeah, I, the, the beautiful space is the place calm. Um, yeah, at the end when uh, Hippolyta has her. Um, Little Kim crush on you wig on. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it is poetic fantasy, and it is very much Chicago. And mm. I, it, it, I mean that theme of invisibility and of the myth of the black existence. Um, yes. They've just been so intentional about all the poetry that mm -hmm. they've used in the series and i mean it just gave me chills can we, you can guys also, can, we, can we take a pause and just appreciate when hippolyta woke up and the doors opened and seraphina was standing there mm -hmm. and like you just see her fro and like i screamed <laughs> i was like visually that was stunning to me like that visually was, yeah this episode was amazing yes yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. she, when she and when she comes back to at the end to talk to Hippolyta, yes, you know, just floating there in space or that in, beautiful in gown, first. nebula thing, yeah. like, just yeah. all of it. Yeah, when you wear a galaxy as your gown, exactly. <laughs> <Just> like <laughs> I, I also I I loved the line when she was in the um when she was going through the military training part, warrior training part, and. Uh, uh, 
the woman says, I can't tell you what true freedom is, but I can tell you that I don't remember the exact line, but the idea is I don't really know what true freedom is, but I can tell you that we refuse to believe what they tell us. And I like that idea. It kind of goes back to something you were saying earlier, Byron, about not exactly knowing how things are going to be solved, where the momentum is, and maybe it doesn't have to resolve to characters having certain stories come to an end. Maybe it's just this ambiguous space of potential, right? And one of the things um, that, that I note in my life as an administrator, and um, often, well, I, I, how do I say this right way? As, as people from underrepresented groups move more and more into positions of authority in this culture, they're going, they probably know it now and they'll know it then that everybody's just doing their best, that no one knows how to do it right. And maybe it's time for other people to have that opportunity to try, right? Have that opportunity to make mistakes. You know, uh, the self-respect doesn't come from getting everything right. Uh, at least not my experience. Self-respect comes from struggling, failing, working, trying. And suddenly, as you said, Brother, when you know you can sustain yourself in all these different contexts. And so then you experience contexts differently because you've been able to survive all of them. So um, uh, moving towards this idea of unleashing possibility in others versus this idea of having the right, being the right person is, is something I, I find fascinating. And to be honest, it was an ethos well, I had to work out because I was never about, right. <laughs> it's about being given that space. Yes, right exactly. And being right. given that space to make mistakes. Yes. And that, um, the inequity of it. You're absolutely that right. Underrepresented group, people in underrepresented groups, underrepresented groups aren't given that space for failure. They have to be perfect. Right. All the time. Right. Even when you're perfect, you're still sometimes not honored and not appreciated for that. Oh, and not at all. Great things, right? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you think, I can't, the thing I is can't it was, remember who said it, but um, it makes me think of, of a phrase, you know, that what we're really fighting for is not for Black people to be great, but for Black people to be average. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> that, that, like, you know, and, and that there, that there's something really important in that. It sounds very trite. But well, it's absolutely true. Yes. You know what I mean? Even the most woke, you know, um, people who proclaim to be woke in positions of authority, you know, are only looking for, you know, talented tents <laughs> you know? oh, to walk through their doors. They, they don't want to deal with average mm. black people. They want to keep right. their the average standards. Is yeah. High quality standards. I, I have this argument all the time about we have to keep our high quality standards. I'm like, maybe you need to like understand uh -oh. what that actually means before you start telling me that it means that I can't hire someone of color. Like, what does that even mean? What do you mean high quality? So a GRE versus life experience versus overcoming adversity? Like, what is high anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent, but yes. But no, you're not, because when you start to when you start to move life experience into the criteria of excellence, you have a different world you have to address, right? Um, and when I hear people say to me, "Well, we have to hire the best," and then they give me this litany of objective measures that are supposed to dictate the best. Objective. All objective. I'm really hearing, all I'm really hearing is what I call identity work, right? Here's the way the world needs to say the same, so I can be the same. Why? So I can be in power. And so what, in, in the end, it's not new to a lot of people, but a lot of these things are there to sustain power. And I, in the end for me, for so that certain people can be the person they want to be and then come up with this rhetoric of objectivity that basically closes the gate so they can pretend it wasn't about power and it wasn't about privilege. It was about their work. It was about their excellence. One of my favorite phrases for the rest of my life is going to be back up. That was almost my favorite phrase from this episode when Atticus is trying to, <laughs> trying to give her all these reasons why she can't have the car. Yeah. And she argues with him for a little while and then she says, back up. No, uh, you know, I don't need permission from you to <laughs> run my own 
business. Oh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and I just love she just quit with the analytic crap and said, power, it's my car, back up. And yeah. in the end, I'm gonna argue that's what it is from top to bottom. And 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 um becoming aware that power is playing itself out. Then you, then that's we have the, we can look at the problem differently, I think. And I'll stop. Well, I mean, what's interesting is that like the, the, the phrase that the quote that you were looking for, um, it was actually the quote I wrote down. It's um, the character's name, the character's name is Nawi. Mm. And she says, I cannot tell you what true freedom is. You have to go and find that for yourself. Yeah. Which I think yeah. is great because in the beginning she says, name yourself. Right. And now they're saying you have to define what that is for you. And that whole fight that so that was actually my whole favorite scene my favorite quote my favorite everything and i think it might just be where i am in my own journey right now and that's that whole thing of like having that power and being a warrior and really taking it to it and saying this is my freedom and it's my freedom to choose to fight you and it's my freedom to choose to take my helmet off and it's my freedom to to choose not to have your babies and wash your dishes and so like the woman in me was like yes and the white woman in me was like i don't there's something else there you know that obviously i'm never going to be able to to quite grasp but i think that whole scene of watching her have that power and just mow through that entire group of white men was just i was on my feet i was hollering my cheerleader came out that whole speech i can't even i couldn't even pick a favorite part of her speech there at the end before she takes her helmet off and all i kept thinking was imagine if there were more of them if we had allowed there to be more of them. And then the look that she had when she first arrived there, right? To see that smile on her face. Yeah. Right. Yeah, when she finally realized she was actually on stage with Josephine Baker, right? And, mm. and then talking at her, right? What, what the, these, these moments of joy for her again, right? So yes. we get these moments of joy. We get her moments of, of power in the battle. We get her moments of, of love, but a love that where she is not secondary. Right. So we get to see all these transformations and everything that I hope that, you know, stays within her. Right. When she comes back and saves everyone at the very end of the series. And yeah, I liked it. We got to see her naked. Yeah. The big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was I wasn't going to raise it. No. <laughs> My husband was like, uh, can, and I'm like, do you need me to leave? <laughs> I, I can i i asked you to leave for atticus i can you know this is, i thought it was great i think your point byron yeah. too like the freedom to have fun the freedom to drink the freedom to be angry right. like that whole scene of like the freedom to be angry and to have that fight and to take it down i don't just i'm just really well done i'm yeah. gonna stop talking yeah. mm. well, the, the spatial temporality once again right and that's why another thing i love about this show is that it's so non-linear and I love right. that. And we saw that play out in this in this episode, right? We saw that non-linear, non-linear, somebody help me with the word, non-linearity. Non-linearity. Not, yeah, what Stanford just said. <laughs> you know, you have see, to be a cultural anthropologist to be able to say that. <laughs> exactly. Well, but it, this was also like quintessentially, like this was quintessentially just straight up Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. I mean, because if you like, all, like all of the stuff, especially in Afrofuturism in terms of time, and about um, how like it kind of embraces Sankofa, this idea that you have to go back to go forward. Um, and um, the other thing that was that, that this was a recitation on was Nomo, the power of the word. word. Um, yes, yes, yes. You know, I mean, it, it was all throughout there. And, and it's like, it was like, you know, that, that was part of my love for this episode. But then at the same time, there was the one moment that was haunting me throughout this entire thing that we no one's talked about it's when before, remember what, what you know so letty and ruby stay behind and they're watching the kids and the kids oh, are sitting I know where you're going. Right? they're playing that cards is, yeah. and the kid says when's bobo coming back because he knows how to play yep yep oh shit. it traumatized no. me that 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 scene actually trauma i, I actually stopped the television and walked away because I just I say, like, damn, he's going, mm. right? And no, I heard the I heard his name the first time. I didn't get the whole line, 
And then when I went back and watched it the second time, I wanted to make sure I heard the whole line. It was like, oh my God, because it you're right, it just instantly puts you in this different space, which is, you know. I mean, he like like I actually think that the that that one of the things that could be really interesting as far as what they do in terms of, of coming to the end of this is to actually have Bobo come back. Mm. Yeah. That to me Agreed. would be the most transformative mm -hmm. um, things that could happen would be for Bobo to come home. Yeah. I'm writing them right Agreed. now. I'm saying, please make that the end. Well, right. And and I mean, what what would that? I mean, I I, I wonder. Sanford, maybe you can speak to this. What would that? What kind of statement would that make? What would that be doing? I mean, I mean, it would blow my mind because the statement is that, you know, I mean, in theory, Bobo did come home, right? Yeah. But what if Bobo was, what if, what if through all this happening, you know, you know, like, like we're so focused on Tulsa, right? Mm -hmm. We're so focused on Tulsa as this point of trauma. You know, I'm wondering what, you know, in this world where anything can happen. Mm hmm Yeah. And by the way, <laughs> that copy of Lovecraft Country that Atticus picks up on the way out, did you see yep. he wrote it? Yes. I did yes. see Yes. So we could be, we could be, all of this could be in a different dimension. And 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 so anything is narratively possible, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't get if we get a I wouldn't be surprised to get a multi-dimensional ending, where we're just decentered from the you know um, our our quest to find someone in this place in this time and and we experience all of them more in terms of possibility. Um, that would be exciting. Because I mean, I think Bobo coming home would would speak just to that. You know, uh, what happens when Black people have the power to tell their own stories, to write their own endings. Yeah. When they have true power over their destiny. Yeah. yeah. You know, what does that world look like? Well, that's a world where Bobo comes home. Yeah. Um, I think that's what this entire episode of Lovecraft Country was about. And I, I agree with Stanford. I think that would be the most perfect ending. Um, yeah. I, I don't... And again, that's another reason why I liked this story, this episode so much, because there was a balance that we haven't seen uh, between mm. darkness and light. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I, I, I hope Bobo comes home. And I, I, I mean, what a thing to, to take that power and write a different ending for that story. And why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I mean, that's what we're fighting for. We're, we're fighting for a yeah. world where our children come home. Absolutely. Where our children, where our fathers who come up yeah. in the 1920s in Birmingham who are mm -hmm. taken off the street and seen as vagrants and arrested and having to going to sit and work in mines in Birmingham. Yep. All these horrible things that have happened, right? That 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 you would have that we would have to be we'd be able to rethink if we came home. Yeah. And I love that because and I just got done teaching before we did this about narrative therapy. So maybe that's where why I'm going this way. But one of the things we often do is change the story and then what did it take to make that change happen? What was different? And I think it tells us what needs to happen now. Yeah. What do we need to do now? And telling it through storytelling. It's such a more salient, potent narrative yeah. that I think drives home a point that isn't made quite as, effect as effectively in other ways, if, if I can say that. Like, so the whole time you were, you were both, uh, both of all of you really were talking as I was thinking, that's narrative therapy. That's what we do is we rewrite the story and we figure out how to get to the ending that we want. And I think that's, a, a, that would be, I think Stanford's right, an amazing place to end up if we could have that. 
Well, and, and it's a true expression of nomo, the power of the word, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, because when, when you look at that, I mean, nomo is also, I mean, it, you know, you know, when you read about, it's also exemplified in the opening of the Bible, right? That, that. It's not that it's not that God said let let there be light. The first thing that God creates is the word. Yep. He creates the word, and he cre and then from that you know first there's like the void. He creates the word, and then the first word is right, and then everything about Adam and Eve, which is which was in the first ep or the second episode, right? Naming, right. You know, so so like these Christian notions of naming are, are you know, are, are colonial, right? Mm -hmm. But these West, the, but but West African, you know, and and to, and to, to the degree that West Africa comes into America in the form of African Americans, you know, in this context, right? It's not. It's it's nomo. It's the word. It is like the ultimate power. To be able to divide, to to de, to define, to say who you are. Hmm. Speak into existence. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're to decolonize our thinking right now. My goodness gracious! <laughs> <laughs> because, because this is the this is this is what the struggle is when when you're teaching rhetoric, right? We, we teach this from this Western, right? But we 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 fail to teach this notion of noma, right? Which mm. is you know which really is an essence of what rhetoric is, right? If you can name these things, if you can give this word, right? And it, 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 it seeps into this whole notion of, 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 of this truth telling by this black woman in this episode. Her truth telling becomes that narrative, becomes that story that you're talking about, Leandra, right? That becomes that storytelling moment, right? How do we create these stories? We create these stories through this power of the word right of this of this naming of something right of, of this naming of uh the, this pain that we've had right how do we name this how do we create this truth telling how do we create a story with that that changes like what you said leandra changes you know where our children can come home mm -hmm. right i don't even know what to say anymore i was gonna say does anyone have anything else they'd like to say about the episode <laughs> I'm going to say one more thing and I'll shut up. I may have said it already, but you, you've just been talking about um, narrative therapy. And I talked earlier about how I, lo I loved how whimsical that the fantasy sequence for her was of just going from possibility to possibility. And the fact is they drug us through all of those. Right. In other words, by telling this, by telling that story in that fantastical way, they actually put us in a more fantastical state. And um, in those states, you know, a possibility. I was going to say possibility is more possible, but no, uh, it is. It makes right? you realize what it is. It makes you want it. Yeah. You know, as a white person, it makes me want that. Mm, and it makes yeah. me want to make what has to happen to make that happen. And I think that's one of the great thing about story storytelling when it's done really well is that it makes you want something, even if it doesn't benefit you. And I think that mm. that's, that is the power of the storytelling aspect of what's happening right now with this show. And I, that's why I'm so happy to see it. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, and I have to give a shout out. Like it's her, the whole like space. I'm such a Star Trek fan. It's a raw, like, I can't say her name. Uh, the communications officer, Ahura. Uh, Ahura. Yes, it's, you know, will be Goldberg decides she's going to be Gaia, or I can't say that name either because I'm tripping up and I'm getting too emotional Gaina. about it. Yes, thank you. I'm thinking Mother Earth because that's how I see her in that show. Like she's just right. everywhere, every present. You know, it's, it's them embracing that. I love the Hippolyta's. Like, doing math and figure it out and do it. Like, I just it brings back all of those wonderful things that I've always enjoyed about sci-fi is that I'm not, it's not always the case, but the moments in which black women are able to be geniuses and be smart and be omnipresent is just, it's a beautiful thing. The, 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 it's interesting how the women, the female characters of the show have sort of, 
their very presence and their growth has really shrunk Atticus. <laughs> well, you know, it, it really, really has. Um, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, she did. And it's all the women. She figured all of that out on her own. <laughs> I just want to put that out there. You know what I mean? She she managed to. It was everything from you know putting the pieces together of what happened to George and code breaking and I mean, she managed to do it on her own. In so was, days. So I as I watched the the female characters of this show develop their powers. Right, we see Letty become a conjurer in the basement. We see Hippolyta become a multi-dimensional multi explorer, or excuse me, Hippolyta become a multi-dimensional explorer. And then we see what's happening to Atticus, right? And Ruby becoming a shapeshifter. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. You see, I, I, I can't help but sense that that's intentional. And I, I can't help but sense yes. that they're trying to say something narratively about male anger. Well, let's think... also not forget Jiha. Yeah. You know, I mean, she's on a really interesting journey because she's on the journey where she's starting as the monster and becoming something else. We haven't right. seen the last of her. Hmm? No, I mean, what, no, what I was after is Atticus is surrounded by all of these extremely powerful women who are solving their problems in ways that aren't the way Atticus is dealing with the world. Including and I, Christina. And I'm just wondering if that's intentional. <laughs> if they're trying to say, we change our narrative this way, not this way. I, that's No, that's just a vibe I get watching it. I'm not trying to say well, that's what they're doing. but I think that's great. And I hope we don't go the way of Game of Thrones, where <laughs> we did the same exact thing in Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. didn't we not? I love Vanessa's reaction to that. Vanessa is like, oh. All right, exactly. tell you what. In Game of Thrones, just for Bran to end up on the throne, on the Iron Throne, Daenerys to die, and Brienne of Tarth to be crying in a corner because Jamie went to go have it off with his sister one last time. <laughs> Suffering <laughs> broth is I'm sorry. I, I can't believe. You know, they, they may have actually snuck a sort of Game of Thrones season eight redo into this. Right, yes. where they actually do it HBO's right. HBO's like, I gotta, we gotta redeem this narrative <laughs> right now. <laughs> well, it's, it's really interesting though, because remember the, the very, remember the very first scene of the, ep of the series was this man coming through with the baseball bat and kind of like almost, mm -hmm. I guess he was supposed to be saving everything or something, right? And so he beats them, almost, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like they're now turning that around, turning that narrative around. Mm. Right? To, to, to say that, you know. And you it's know, interesting. Just, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. I'm, done. I'm done. What was the interesting with the, with, with the baseball bat is, so Jackie Robinson shows up and beats the monster with a baseball bat, right? Right. And then the monster reforms itself. Yeah. So to, what I think is interesting, Byron, what you're, what you're bringing up, when you bring that up in terms of dealing with it, it's it's kind of hinted that that's not the way it works. It looks heroic, it looks great, but in the end, shit just comes back. Yeah. And then the creature that he destroys is the archetypal yeah. Lovecraftian beast, uh, Cthulhu, right? Yeah. So, um, well, now you just, now you got me all agreeing and believing that that's what they're <laughs> doing here is trying to create a, an alternative narrative to to um at least what the stuff the route they have uh, atticus on and i'm not trying to judge there i'm just trying to be descriptive of what i think is going I, on I, I hope you're right scott i hope that is where they are going with this Got it. They they already prove that these all of these women are way more powerful than Atticus, but <laughs> i have a funny feeling <laughs> you know what now that you say that i think they're going to save him I think he actually is cursed. I think he is marked. I think he is going to be potentially sacrificed, and I think the women are going to save him. That's what I would predict. All right. All right. Drop the mic for Scott. Oh, look at that. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Any final comments? 
So that about wraps it up for tonight's episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. Brothers and sisters, please tell the audience where they can find you on social media, and we shall start with Vanessa. Um, I am on Facebook, Dr. Vanessa Hints, also on Twitter, at Dr. Vanessa Hints, and on Instagram, at Dr. Vanessa, period, Hints. There you go. Sienna. You can find me on Twitter at C-I-C-I-G-R-E-A-V-E-S, at C.C. Greaves. Thank you. Stanford? You can find me on Facebook and Twitter at S.W. Carpenter. All right, then Byron. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under Byron Craig and on Twitter at Byron B. Craig and on Instagram at Steve B at Byron C. <laughs> All righty then. And Leandra. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> they got me tickled. Um, um, so you can find me um, on Twitter at Paris Leandra at P A R R I S Leandra. Paris, like the two R's, not like France, and Instagram at Leandra Paris and Facebook Leandra Paris Griffiths. Excellent. Um, I'm Scott Jordan. You can find me on Twitter at dark underscore loops. You can find all episodes of the Sears of Artem at the Dark Loops Productions channel on YouTube. If you'd like to leave feedback about this, pad, this podcast or any podcast that we've done so far, please leave it below on this YouTube channel or send a message to dark loops productions at gmail.com. We'll be sure to read it at the end of our next podcast. So there it is from all of us to all of you, big hugs. And remember, I, I am. Bye-bye. You don't need no reason to travel. You know mother's living in plain sight. Oh, God's dealing there. Drives a world insane. Turn that evil darkness to peace.